Hello everyone, and welcome back to our series on sorting algorithms. After last lecture's super in-depth discussion on merge sort, this time we're going to tone it down a bit and talk about one of the most interesting and unique algorithms out there, cycle sort. Now, normally I jump straight into a definition, but today I'm not going to do that. We're first going to begin with a little thought experiment. How do we define a list as sorted? Well, we can define a sorted list as a data set in which each element is greater than or equal to the element just before it, and less than or equal to the element right after it. This simple definition is something that we've been working on this entire series, so it shouldn't be too much of a surprise. So let me follow up with a harder question. How do we define an element as sorted? Ah, now things get a little bit more complicated. You might be tempted to think that the definition doesn't change. We can define a sorted element as an element which is greater than or equal to the element before it and less than or equal to the element after it. But that's simply not the case. For example, take the array on your screen now. If we go by this definition, the element at the third index, 3, would be considered sorted since it's greater than or equal to 1 and less than or equal to 5. However, if we pull up the actual sorted list below it, you can see that this is simply not the case. There are elements outside the scope of the element at the third index which impact its final sorted position. So if that's not the answer, what is? Well, an element can be considered sorted if it is at a position that is equal to the number of elements in the dataset that it is greater than or equal to. Going back to the list we used previously, the element at the third index is greater than both 1 and 2, which means that its sorted index is 2. And if you look at the final sorted list, this is indeed the case. Okay, so now we have a definitive way to tell whether a certain element in our list is sorted. So what? I can hear you asking. How does this help us with sorting algorithms? Well, just make sure to keep this fact in mind as we delve further into this episode. Okay, thought experiment over, let's now jump straight into cycle sort. We can define cycle sort as an unstable, in place, comparison based sorting algorithm, which sorts the list using a set of cycles. Each cycle consists of placing an element at its sorted index in the dataset, then taking the element at that sorted index and placing it at its sorted index in the dataset, and then repeating this until the cycle is complete. If we do this for each cycle in the dataset, then what we are left with is a sorted dataset. This algorithm is known for being theoretically optimal for the total number of writes to the original dataset, meaning we only ever overwrite data when we're placing an element at its correct position. This is quite a confusing statement, but don't worry, it becomes much clearer further on when looking at the example sort and visualization. But to give you a little taste of cycle sort, and also introduce some important components of cycle sort, let's do a quick example. So let's say we have an array consisting of five elements, like shown on your screen now. Let's begin with our first cycle. We begin with the first element, and our goal is to place that integer at its sorted index in the dataset. In this small example, we can easily see that 10 is the largest element in this array and so its sorted index in the dataset is at index location 4, or the last one. What we then do is take the element at index location 4, or the integer 5, and place it at its sorted index in the dataset. Taking a quick look at the list, we can see that the integer 5's correct location in the dataset is at index location 2. We now repeat the process again, taking the element at index location 2, or the integer 1, and writing it to its correct place in the list. Since 1 is the smallest element in the array, we place it at the 0th index. This completes our first cycle. We then move up the array to the next integer which has not yet been sorted to start the next cycle, which coincidentally is the first index. The element at the first index, 7, is considered sorted at the third index, and so we place it there and then take the integer that is currently there, 3, and place it at its correct position in the array, or at the first index. 
What we've now done here is complete a pretty robust example of cycle sort. You can see the differing colors of arrows represent different cycles in the list, the purple being the first cycle that we completed, and the blue being the second. This process uses something known as cycle decomposition, which is actually derived from statistics of all places. For this particular unsorted dataset, we say that it has the cycle decompositions shown on your screen now, with the parentheses indicating a particular cycle. Each of these groups of elements simply means take each element and cycle it forwards to the next element in the decomposition. So for the first one, it would be take 10 and put it where 5 is, then take 5 and put it where 1 is, and then take 1 and put it where 10 was. For the second decomposition, it would be take 7 and put it where 3 is, and then take 3 and put it where 7 was. This is the backbone of cycle sort. The big question then becomes, how do we generate these cycle decompositions? We were able to do it in our robust example by just looking at the dataset and intuitively generating these decompositions, but unfortunately for us, the computer is not so intuitive. What we need is a way to determine where a particular element in the array should be placed so that we can generate decompositions. In other words, we need a way to determine where in the dataset that an element is sorted. Luckily for us, we know how to do this from the beginning of the episode. All we need to do is use our definition for a sorted element to determine its correct place in the list. Essentially, we count the number of elements less than or equal to the current element, and we can use that to determine where the element should be located. Then, we can use that to generate the decompositions and sort the list accordingly. Okay, so now we've built a pretty good framework and understanding of cycle sort. Generate the compositions using the definition of a sorted element, then use those compositions to sort the array. Next up, we're going to dig a little deeper and go through the full cycle sort pseudocode. We start by defining a few variables. The first is current element. This is an integer which will hold the current element that we are writing to its correct position index. Next, we define a position integer. This will hold the correct position index of the current element in the sorted list. We'll determine this using a loop that's further down in the pseudocode. Jumping into the actual pseudocode now, we begin by looping from 0 to the size of the array minus 2. This will take us from the first element to the second to last index. We only loop to the second to last index of the dataset because later on we're going to be entering another loop, which begins at 1 plus the index of this loop. If we try to do this on the last element in the array, we'll receive an error because there is no element right above the last one in the list. The index of this loop gets used so often that I'm going to name it the outer index, as it's the index of the outermost loop of our pseudocode. Okay, so once we enter this loop, we set current element equal to the element at the outer index. On our first pass through the loop, this will be the element at the zeroth index. During the second pass, it'll be the first, and so on, to the size of the dataset minus 2. Following this, we set the position integer equal to the outer index. This gives the position index an initial value that we can increment so that eventually it's equal to the correct position of the current element. We then jump straight into another loop. This loop will be the one which we use to determine the correct position of the current element in the dataset. So to do that, we need to traverse across the entirety of the unsorted list so from the outer index plus 1 to the size of the list minus 1. This takes us from the element that's right above the outer index through to the rest of the list. For each element that we run across, we add 1 to the position integer if the element at that index is less than or equal to the current element. After this loop terminates, we will have successfully determined the correct index of the current element in the array. Using this position index, we can correctly place the current element. Before we do that though, we have to do a few checks. If the position index is the same as the outer index, then we know that the element is already in its correct location, 
and we have reached the end of this particular decomposition. Now if this is true, we can skip the rest of the pseudocode and iterate the outer index, moving on to the next decomposition. Now if the position index is not the same as the outer index, then we have a loop which increases the position variable while the current element is equal to the element at the position index. This line of pseudocode is simply used to move the element past any duplicate elements in the array. Now the pseudocode for cycle sort is actually so long that we are now going to move to a second slide to cover the rest of it. The final check that we do is to make sure that the position index is not equal to the outer index. This is similar to the first check that we did to make sure that we're not trying to cycle an element that's already been sorted. We do this again after accounting for duplicates to make 100% sure that after skipping those duplicates, we're not back to where we started and cycling the same element over and over again, as that would cause an infinite loop, which nobody likes. Now if the position index is not equal to the index of the initial loop, then we're okay to swap the current element and the element at the position index. This takes care of the first element of our decomposition. Now we have to repeat the same process for the rest of the elements in the decomposition. Luckily, there's an easy way to encase this all in a loop. What we do is have another while loop which runs until the position index is equal to the index of the outer index. What this does is ensure that we only terminate cycling elements once we've reached the beginning of our cycle. By stopping once we reach the index of the outer loop, we ensure that we are stopping immediately once we have completed the decomposition and know that all elements in that decomposition are now in their correct sorted indexes. Okay, so inside of this while loop, we simply encase the methodology from outside the loop. You'll notice that the code inside of this while loop is almost exactly the same as the code which preceded the while loop. This is because we follow the same exact process for each element that we're cycling through. The only difference is that instead of checking that the location is not equal to the start, we check that the current element is not equal to the element at the position's index. So while it may look like a lot of code, much of it is reused, which hopefully makes it a little bit easier to comprehend. And that is the pseudocode for cycle sort. I'll be honest, going through the research for this episode, I knew nothing about cycle sort and it took me quite a while to get a grasp on the algorithm in its entirety. So feel free to rewatch this segment or ask any questions you may have about the algorithm in the comments below. Now that we hopefully have a better understanding of the algorithm, let's jump into an example sort using cycle sort, which will help show off how it works in practice. Now again, just like with merge sort, we're going to be going over things a little bit more intuitively not putting each step up on the screen as we go, like I did for the more simple sorting algorithms. I'll still be explaining each step I take though, so don't worry about that. Okay, so let's pull up our list of eight unsorted elements and get to sorting. We start by defining our integers, current element and position. We don't declare these with values yet since they'll get defined within the actual code. Then we begin with the outer loop. We start from zero and begin a loop that will take us through to the second to last element using the outer index, which I'll also add to the top and also color code on the array accordingly. The first thing we do after entering this loop is set the current element equal to the element at the outer index, and so current element becomes three since that's the element at the zero with index. Next, we set the position integer equal to the outer index. Since the outer index is zero, position becomes zero. Now next, we need to determine where this current element should be placed within the array. So what we do is loop from one above the outer index to the end of the list, increasing the position integer for every element that's less than or equal to the current element. If we were to go through each and every element and then do that for every integer we need to sort, that would take forever but since we know that we're only increasing the position integer for elements that are less than or equal to the current element, we can speed things up. Through this loop that we take, 
we will end up with only two elements less than or equal to the current element 3, those being the integers 1 and 2. So after looping through to the end of the list, the position integer will end up being 2. The current element and outer index are not equal to each other, and this means that we have not yet reached the end of our first cycle decomposition. This, along with the fact that we don't have any duplicates, means we can swap the current element with the element at the position index. As a result of this, the current element becomes 1, and the element at the position index becomes 3. Now you'll notice this is 3's rightful spot in the array, and you'll notice as we move on that it will not change from this position. We have solidified 3's place in the list, and it will stay there. Now, we simply repeat this process for the rest of this particular decomposition. We reset the position integer to be the same as the outer index, and again loop from right above the outer index through to the rest of the list. After looping through the list, you'll see that the position index will not change, since there are no elements in the list which are less than or equal to the current element. Additionally, the current element is not equal to the element at the position index, and so this means that 1 gets slotted in as the zeroth element of the array, and 3 coincidentally becomes the current element. Another interesting thing that happens is that we've now actually reached the exit clause for this particular cycle decomposition. If you look, the position integer is equal to the outer index. This means that we swapped all possible integers in this particular cycle and are ready to move on with our outer loop. So we increase outer index to 1 and get ready to start the process all over again with a completely new decomposition. I'm going to add the first one down below just so we can keep track. So since we're back at the beginning of our pseudocode again, we simply restart the cycle setting the position integer equal to the outer index and the current element equal to the integer at the outer index, which is 5. Now we need to find out where 5 goes in the array, and so we start at the outer index plus 1 and count the number of elements less than or equal to the current element. The integers 3, 4, and 2 are all less than the current element 5, and so our position index gets set to the current position index plus 3, which is 1 plus 3, or 4. Now, since the position integer is not equal to the outer index, and we have no duplicates, we can swap the current element with the element at the position integer. This means we swap 5 and 9. Now we enter the second loop again. We reset the position integer to 1 so that it's equal to the outer index, and start counting. Now the integers 3, 5, 4, 2, and 7 are all less than or equal to the current element 9. So we add that number 5 to our position integer 1 and get a final index location of 6. Our current element is not equal to the element at the position index, so we are good to swap the two elements. After this, the position integer is still not equal to the outer index, which means we're not done with this particular decomposition just yet. We go back to the start of the loop and set the position integer back to 1. We then again loop from 1 above the outer index to the end of the data set and count the number of elements that are less than or equal to the current element 2. Now you'll notice there are no elements less than or equal to 2 in the latter part of the list, and so we are now done with this cycle decomposition, since after the count, the position integer and outer index will be equal to each other. We swap 2 into its correct position in the list, and that decomposition is done. We now increase the outer index. Now the thing is, we know the integer at the second index is already sorted. It was sorted during our first pass through the list, so we can actually skip over a bunch of code here. Essentially, what's going to happen is that the code will determine that the correct place for the integer 3 is at index location 2, realize that it's the same index as the outer index, and our checks that we talked about earlier will exit us out of that particular loop and allow us to move on. 
So the next time the computer does any actual sorting will be once we reach the first element which is unsorted, or the third index. So again, we repeat the process for this new decomposition. We set position equal to the outer index, or 3, and current element equal to the element at the position index, or 10. Then, we loop from the outer index plus 1 to the end of the list and count the number of elements less than or equal to 10. As it just so happens to turn out, 5, 4, 9, and 7 are all less than or equal to 10, so we add 4 to the position index and get a final value of 7. There are no duplicates, and so we're good to swap the elements at the position index with the current element. The position index is not equal to the outer index, and so we keep going. We set the position index back to the outer index, and begin looping up again. 5 and 4 are both less than the current element 7, and so we add 2 to the position index to get its final value of 5. Once again, the element at the position index is not equal to the current element, and so we swap the current element with the element at the position index. After this, the position index is still not equal to the outer index, so we keep chugging along. We reset the position index to the outer index, so we can start counting one more time. This time, there are no elements less than the current element 4 in the latter half of the list, and so we end the loop with the position index still being 3. We pass our checks and swap the element at the position index with the current element one last time. Now, the position index is equal to the outer index, so we can finally exit the loop and add the decomposition to the list of current ones. Now what ends up happening here is that we increase the outer index until we reach the second to last element without having to make any swaps. We know this because the list is already sorted. Once this happens, we can exit the outer loop and know that our cycle sort is done. Three different cycle decompositions have turned this unsorted list into a sorted one. I understand this may have been a bit complicated, especially without the steps on screen, so feel free to use the timestamps in the description to go back and rewatch this segment if you are still confused. Additionally, you may leave a comment down below regarding any further questions. So now that we personally know how to work through a cycle sort, at least on a small scale, let's jump into the visualizer and take a look at how the algorithm works on a large scale. Now, I'm really not supposed to be biased, but I will say that cycle sort has one of the most interesting visualizations out there. As the algorithm begins, Notice how you can see that elements simply pop into place where they're supposed to be, almost as if they're magically being placed there by a computer science fairy godmother. Don't be fooled, however, because that is ridiculous. There's no way that a fairy godmother would waste her time on a Java sorting algorithm visualizer. What you're actually seeing is the power of cycle sort. Let's run it again. Now the elements are going too fast and are a bit too small for you to see, but what's happening is that once a color gets popped into place, the color that occupied that place is getting popped into place. The algorithm cycles through the different elements to create a sorted list. Pretty neat. As always, more visualizations will be included in the visualization episode coming out later this week, so stay tuned for that. Now that we have a pretty good understanding of the algorithm and how it works, let's talk about its time complexity. Now if you've been paying attention, then you might be a little bit worried for this segment. I mean, for each element, we compared it to almost every other element in the list. There's no way that this algorithm can be that efficient. And you'd be right. For cycle sort's best, average, and worst case scenario equations, it has a time complexity of O of n squared. And its worst case space complexity will be O of 1. Again, this has to do with the fact that we calculate each element's correct position in the array before we do anything with it. This adds up over time, resulting in an O of n squared time complexity. Now, you might be jumping to conclusions right now, typing out a comment like, why would you spend 25 minutes teaching me about this algorithm if its time complexity equations are terrible? I am unsubscribing and reporting your channel to YouTube. 
Well, while its time complexity equations may lead you to believe that the algorithm is utter garbage, that's simply not the case. To prove it, let's talk about some common cycle sort implementations. Now when thinking about things that make cycle sort unique, the one huge thing that comes to mind is that cycle sort is theoretically optimal in the number of writes to the original array. If you think about it, an element being sorted using cycle sort either gets written zero times if it's already in its correct location, or one time to be placed at its correct location. With any other algorithm, we write elements multiple times, placing them in temporary locations until they are finally sorted. The fact that cycle sort calculates the correct position of an element before placing it there makes it extremely useful for when writing to and from data is expensive, such as with EE proms or flash memory. EE proms or electrically erasable programmable read only memory and flash memory are both used all around you in computers, microcontrollers, smart cards, electronic devices, etc., etc. So while the time complexity equations may make cycle sort out to be an extremely efficient algorithm, the truth of it is that the low write count allows cycle sort to be implemented in an albeit small but very important sect of computer science. And with that, we have concluded our discussion on cycle sort. To recap, it is an unstable, in place, comparison based sorting algorithm which sorts the list using cycles. Each cycle consists of placing an element at its sorted index in the dataset, and then taking the element at that index and placing that one in its sorted index as well. We then repeat this until the cycle is complete. If we do this for each cycle in the array, it will result in a sorted array. Next time, we'll be tackling the most infamous algorithm of them all, quicksort. So stay tuned for that, and thank you so much for watching.